I see a lot of people that were going to be here that weren't because they're completely out of it and we could not wake them up this morning for anything. Uh, I'm Cyrus Picari. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of VirusMD Corporation. Uh, we're in Dallas, Texas and you may know us for our software. Lately we're doing antivirus applications for the pocket PC and wireless phones. And. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, first of all, thank Jennifer Granick for this disclaimer. Is Jennifer here right now? No. Uh, she suggested this one, and that's, remember, you need permission to alter someone else's system, even if you're trying to fix it. And so basically what that's saying is don't try this at home because it will get you arrested. And a public service announcement. For those of you that can't wait a whole other year for DEF CON, there is going to be a security conference, hacking conference in Dallas, Texas this winter. Uh, you can visit it on the web at dallascon.com. And so far the sponsors are several different groups including soldierx.com, hack3r, checksum.org, Black Code, which is a nice group, Security News Portal, and World of Hell. And lately Security Writers Guild is going to be sponsoring it also. So if you have a hacking group and you want to sponsor or speak at this conference, you can let me know. For those of you that want the full version of this talk in uh, detail, you can download it on the web. It's at virusmd.com slash defcon.html and you can grab it as a Word document, or if you want a text file, you can just email me uh, through virusmd.com. Now, who can recognize this virus? Raise your hand. Melissa, Melissa close. That's right, that's the Anna Kornikova virus. So, uh, as you can see, it's quite a deadly virus. And uh, and a lot of people that I talked to said it was worth opening this virus, even though they knew it was a virus, just to see her picture. Now, just as an overview of our talk, uh, what we're going to present today is that the unchecked proliferation of information networks, such as the Internet, uh, leaves society vulnerable to collapse. And we're going to show how viruses actually counter this vulnerability by stabilizing and strengthening global networks. Uh, so in other words, we're going to show how virus writers can save the world. Now, who here has ever written a virus? Raise your hand. You don't have to admit to it if you don't want to. Who here has ever been infected with a virus? Raise your hand. Probably most of you have. Uh, well, the problem is that the Internet has become a single complex organism, much like the human body. And it's no longer, to, no longer sufficient to immunize individual cells in that body. For example, putting antivirus scanners on individual computers is missing the whole picture. And basically, we need some way to immunize the entire body of the Internet at once. And we've seen that current antivirus solutions don't work because uh, one virus, the I Love You virus, did an estimated 10 to $15 billion of damage. That's just from one piece of code. So our current solutions fail. Well, what we're going to show today is we're going to use examples from medicine to formulate a computer virus vaccine. We're actually going to write a virus that's going to strengthen the entire Internet. And we're going to propose an attenuated computer virus. Attenuated means weakened. So basically, you cut off part of the payload or some of the vectors, and you have a weakened pathogen. And we're going to draw on examples from both history and medicine to show that good computer viruses are not only possible, but that they're inevitable if we want to prevent the collapse of civilization. Well, first, let's start with some historical examples. And uh, 
those of you who are history majors, and actually most of you are probably better at me than this, but looking back in the Middle Ages, we know that the Black Plague uh, set European civilization back the equivalent of a thousand years, and we're going to show that in a second. Uh, a more recent virus, smallpox, single-handedly destroyed the Native American civilization. So viruses do cause the collapse of civilization. Now this next slide is a graph showing the population of Europe in the Middle Ages. And on the vertical axis, you can see the uh, units are in millions of persons. And on the horizontal axis is time. And if you look here in the center, you can see that right around the 14th century, the population of Europe was abruptly nearly cut in half. So essentially, one out of every two people dropped dead all throughout Europe, and this was all from a single pathogen. It took uh, several years for the population to recover, but even longer for civilization to recover because this virus caused famine and unemployment and widespread civil war. What happened is the rich nobles severely suppressed the poor people, and it, the whole process set civilization back about a thousand years. There's a, a more recent biological virus that destroyed a civilization, and that's smallpox. And smallpox was brought over by the Europeans when they invaded or when they explored the New World. Now, the problem is that the Native Americans had no immunity to smallpox. The Europeans had been building up immunity for years. But when, the, uh, when they brought it over, the uh, natives had no resistance, so it basically killed all of them. And 95% of the population of Central America and Mexico uh, was wiped out literally in a few years. And that's, that's almost overnight in the terms of global time scale. And 50% of North America was wiped out. So the Europeans basically walked into an empty continent. There were no warriors left to defend this continent, just a handful. That was the end of their civilization. Now, none of you have ever seen a case of this in your lives. This is a picture of smallpox. And this is the uh, caused by the virus. Now, this has actually been eradicated from the Earth. And the reason you haven't seen this is because we came up with a good vaccine to cure it. And we're going to show the, why this is important with our computer virus vaccine later on. Now, when the smallpox vaccine first came out, it was extremely dangerous. And a lot of people that took the vaccine died. So people were violently opposed to any concept of a vaccine. But with time, the vaccine was improved. And uh, by 1977, the World Health Organization announced that smallpox was cured. There was no more smallpox left in the world. Uh, the only sample is in a very tight security government research station and they keep it there under observation. And probably a few other countries have a sample as well. So getting back to our computer virus, why do we need a vaccine? Well, we've seen that any attempts at uh, antivirus uh, programs so far have been limited. And we saw that with the I love you virus, which failed to prevent a global infection that brought the internet to its knees. There's also been attempts at digital immune systems. Uh, for example, IBM Corporation came up with a digital immune system where they uh, were able to pick up samples of viruses in the wild and automatically extract signatures and then send that uh, patch back out to their subscribers. So this is kind of an encapsulated digital immune system. But it's not really a true vaccine for the, for the entire internet body because they're not really using a virus. They're using just purified code. And so what we've shown is from history and medicine that vaccines are very necessary and they're inevitable if we want to prevent global catastrophe. We need some kind of holistic solution. Well, unfortunately, there's problems to any kind of idea of a vaccine. And number one among that is the antivirus community. The antivirus or AV community hates virus writers. They really, really hate you guys. And you can see that by going on news groups such as alt.comp.virus. And you can see the arguments go back and forth. 
Um, and it's kind of funny to read it sometimes because you see the two sides arguing, but you realize from an objective point that they're really not that far apart, yet they're so, they're so violently opposed to each other. Now, we can, we can counter the AV Corporation's arguments by looking at medicine, and for them to say there's no such thing as a good virus is ridiculous. Uh, for example, every day doctors inject kids with deadly viruses when they give vaccines. The polio virus vaccine, for example, is a real virus. It's, it's live. It's just attenuated. So you're getting the real virus. And this falls under a utilitarian model. Utilitarianism says that you should do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, for those of you that study ethics. And this is the model that society allows the government to do this to us under. Well, who will release this uh, global vaccine? And most importantly, don't try it yourself, uh, because if you do, it's, it's highly illegal right now. Uh, spreading live viri, viri will land you in jail. Probably, as far as I can see, the government right now would be the only possible solution for that. And for one thing, they, they can do what they want and get away with it. There's not much you can do. You can't really sue the government. Uh, another benefit is they will indemnify you from harm. Remember the polio virus that all of you get when you're young? That's a real virus. Now, if you say your brother, when you're young, gets the polio virus vaccine, and you don't get the vaccine for some reason, you can actually catch live polio from your brother. That's called vaccine-induced polio, and it can kill you or paralyze you. Now, what happens in that case is the government will actually pay damages to your parents for the damage you suffered. That's little consolation, obviously, but that's how the, the government works. And that, that falls under a paternalistic model, and paternalism means being fatherly. In other words, society allows the government to do what it wants because we think that it knows best. And as far as I can see, it would, this virus, virus vaccine we're talking about would probably be released by a global epidemiology body like the World Health Organization. They would have to create a particular branch made up of uh, programmers because you need somebody that knows how to track vaccines around the world. Well, finally, the, talking about the computer virus itself, what characteristics does it need to have? For one thing, the vaccine should be open source. And the main reason for this is quality control. Because we're releasing this vaccine globally, we know that open source models give a much higher level of quality control and debugging. And number two, it should be international. We can't have individual governments releasing vaccines for an obvious reason. For example, suppose China released a vaccine, but they were the only ones who had immunity to that virus. That would be viewed as an act of war by all the other, com uh, all the other countries. So in order to prevent that situation, it would have to be released internationally. Third, the virus should be attenuated, which basically means castrated. You should take off part of its payload or reduce its number of vectors. The goal, what you're trying to do is create a virus that will confer immunity without severe damage. And finally, the vaccine should be live. In other words, you need real replicating code. The, to just to extract a virus signature like virus scanners do right now, it's, we know that's not as good. Think back to the polio virus vaccine. That's why doctors use the real live virus in our bodies. OK, now here's your test for the day. You guys go to school, so uh, you thought you were going to be free of tests this summer, but you're not. Who can tell me who said this quote? If you, if you can guess it, raise your hand. Uh, who's that? Fred Cohen. Fred Cohen. OK, we have a, a guess for Fred Cohen. Who agrees with that? Uh, actually, that's incorrect. Uh, anyone else? Pardon? McAfee, good guess. You guys are going to be surprised when you hear the answer. <laughs> that's, that's not correct. Let me read it. It says that beneficial viruses are a simplest solution that's always wrong. A virus is not bad or good based on its payload. Viral propagation methods are inherently bad, and giving them beneficial payloads doesn't help.
Is that Bill Gates? Close. You're very close. This was Bruce Schneier, actually. He said this in a talk in September 2000. He said that uh, viral propagation methods are inherently bad. So we all know Bruce, and we love him. He's a regular here at DEF CON. Uh, but you may want to ask him about this one. Now, who knows which virus this is? You guys got to know this. Very good. The Jennifer Lopez virus. Once again, using the power of just her behind, uh, this virus infected uh, millions of computers. People were tempted to uh, open the uh, I love you virus to get a glimpse of this. Uh, sorry, the Jennifer Lopez virus. So just winding down here, there, there, in 1997, Veselin Bontchev and wrote a famous paper about the 12 reasons why there can never be a good virus. And has anyone read that paper? Raise your hand, a couple of you. Okay, I see there's some hardcore virus people out here. And uh, now this was a very famous paper, and for a couple years this was the gold standard. But then in April 1999, a member of the Ultimate Chaos Virus Group came along and utterly destroyed these arguments. Uh, and that author was Midnight. And if you read his paper, it's quite eloquent. I'm not going to go into all his arguments right now. But what we're going to do is present arguments from a different angle, saying why you can have a good virus. And I just want to go through these 12 points very quickly. Uh, well, number one, the antivirus companies argue that uh, you can't have a good virus because it takes away your control. And you you just feel helpless. But actually, we know that that that's a good thing in sometimes. For example, there's certain vaccines doctors give where it, it confers what's called herd immunity, like a herd of sheep. They know if they could only immunize 50% of kids in a class, those 50% will infect their classmates either by sneezing on them or by smearing snot all over them or by not washing their hands after they wipe themselves. And this actually is a good thing because they pass the immunity on to their friends. That's called herd immunity. So that lack of control can be good. Number two is recognition difficulty. And this argument is that, well, our scanners won't be able to tell a, your good virus from a bad one. But that's what we want. We want uh, a immune response from the world antivirus software. That's how it's going to work. Number three is resource wasting. And this argument says that computer viruses waste CPU and memory. They're just a waste of time and money. But actually, that can be a good thing. For example, uh, how many of you have had a flu shot? I'm sure most of you have had a, a flu shot at some point. What happens after you get a flu shot? How do you feel the next day? You feel sick. Uh, a lot of times, you'll get a sore throat or a fever. And the reason is the when you fight this weakened, attenuated flu vaccine, your body shuts down critical pathways and strengthens others. And so basically, it's wasting your resources. But in the end, you end up being immune to influenza, which is a good thing. So that takes care of that argument. Next, number four, is bug containment. And the AVs argue that badly written viruses spread software bugs. But we know that. Software bugs are ubiquitous. They're everywhere anyway. That's not really a big issue. And this is just one more argument for an open source model. Uh, next is compatibility problems. And this is the, the AVers argue that, well, your, your virus vaccine will set off all our checks on monitors and integrity checkers. But again, we want that. We want to do that in an, in an attenuated fashion before it becomes a real problem. Next is effectiveness. And the argument here is that you should use some kind of emulator or simulator. You shouldn't infect the total system. You should stop it at a firewall or a sandbox. But again, we know from examples from medicine, like the polio vaccine, really getting the full replicating code in your system is the best way to really test it and strengthen it. Uh, just continuing, the last six, uh, unauthorized data modification states that it's illegal to modify someone else's, attack someone else's system 
but again, this just argues for uh, it needs to be done probably by a central agency. We all, we all let doctors inject us with deadly vaccines when we get vaccinations anyway. We permit that. In fact, we embrace it. So a society will embrace this with time. Next is copyright and ownership problems. And this is not a big argument. It says that basically viruses can void copyright contracts. But again, the government could indemnify you from this and say that if you're infected with our vaccine, uh, then that's not going to affect your copyright at all. Next is possible misuse. And this argument says that it argues that, well, virus writers will use our good vaccine to spread viruses. But this is kind of silly because a virus writer could write a much better virus himself or herself. He doesn't want to use a weakened or attenuated vector. Uh, next is responsibility. And this states that we should not give any excuse to these quote, juvenile virus writers. We don't want them to, if we do this, then they're going to say, well, I was just writing a virus to save the world. I was just trying to help people. But those of you who heard Sarah Gordon talk at DEF CON here last year, uh, she spoke on the ethics of virus writers. And she talked about a cycle where virus writers start out at a low ethical cycle sometimes and progress through to higher levels of ethics. But that there's always a continuing cycle there will always be people releasing viruses without the need for an excuse. So I think this whole argument is kind of irrelevant. The last two are closely related. And they, they talk about negative common meaning and trust problems. And what this says is that people will never trust the idea of a virus. The word virus is just too nasty. It's too evil. We're never going to accept it in society. But I think if we. Uh, we look back to uh, our medical vaccines, we see that in, in time people will embrace it. Now, one of my colleagues who heard me practicing this talk suggested that, well, why don't you just change your virus, learn from the FBI, and change the name of your virus to DCS-1000 or something like they did with carnivore. And uh, I don't know, do you guys watch the whole FBI carnivore issue? They've changed the name to DCS-1000, as far as I know, in a public relations move. But that didn't help them too much. In conclusion, uh, we've shown that viruses are needed to stabilize global networks and to prevent the collapse of civilization. And we've proposed an open source, international, attenuated computer virus vaccine. And we've shown that it's not only possible, but that it's inevitable if we want to prevent the collapse of society. And for those of you that are new to DEF CON uh, or who are new to hacking or security, uh, let me make a shameless plug for my book. It's called Windows Internet Security, Protecting Your Critical Data. And it's going to be published by Prentice Hall this fall. And it's basically a very gentle introduction to hacking and if you've never done a buffer overflow or you don't understand what such things are, I recommend you get this book before jumping into hacking exposed or something more advanced. And uh, I was asked to announce that coming up after this talk, uh, we have a talk by Little Elam, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, on renegade wireless networks. And then after that, in this room, there's going to be a talk by the famous Robert Graham the chief technology officer of uh, Network ICE. He was scheduled to speak yesterday. So if anyone missed, uh, came to that talk and was disappointed, stick around for the talk I in an hour. And that's going to be really good. And what I'm going to do now is open the floor up to questions. Yes, we have a question back here. OK, we have uh, a question saying, how do we attenuate the virus, You know, lowering the number of vectors and things like that? And uh, basically, this is going to be up to a lot smarter people, such as yourselves. Uh, for example, think back to the Melissa virus. Those of you who studied Melissa know that it had a certain number of vectors, like it infected the first 50 people on your Outlook contact list. But once you got it, you have, you're immune to it. It conferred immunity. It doesn't reinfect you. So in a way, it had kind of a vaccinating, immunizing property to it. 
if you wanted to create a vaccine, you might try uh, reducing the number of vectors, making it two or three, for example. In that way, it would, or even give a time delay, uh, saying that it couldn't spread that fast, maybe one email every hour or every six hours. Uh, that way, you wouldn't shut down the whole internet within a couple days. You'd still get the immunity, but nobody would notice. It'd just be a minor infection. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, question here. Could you? You can. What? Right. <laughs> Come up and use the mic. <laughs> I should have a wireless mic, actually. I don't know if it works. All right. So what's the good virus going to do? Is it going to uh, provide some immunity, or is it going to just induce people to upgrade their antivirus software? Well, thanks. I think you've answered my question for me. <laughs> it's uh, probably the most important effect I can see right off the bat is it'll raise awareness. And that in itself confers a lot of immunity because, I mean, if you ask somebody off the street, they probably have never updated their antivirus software ever you know, since they put their computer up, and that may be three, four years out of date. We're talking about normal people off the street. And most of us, uh, I mean, probably a lot of us don't even up update it every two weeks or every month or so. So in, in one way it can raise awareness, but uh, we're hoping it will have a lot more, a lot more impact that we can't even foresee. So how's that going to stop another global killer uh, like I Love You? That's a that's an, another excellent question, and uh, the the only thing I can foresee is examples from medicine. What what we do in uh, uh, what the doctors do in medicine is they research what viruses are coming from Asia or Taiwan in the summer months. They create a vaccine. They quickly synthesize uh, big vatfuls of it and they distribute that. By the time the virus makes it over from uh, Asia. Uh, they've already got these samples ready. Everyone's already immunized in the United States. Now, we ha just have to work much faster, obviously, in computers. And maybe a system like IBM's would help in that situation where it could be done automatically in the wild. But I, I feel personally that it's going to be done by people who, who actually are fanatics about viruses. They scour the news groups and they know what's up and coming. There's always going to be some that slip through the cracks, just as in medicine. Does that answer your question? Okay. Question right here. Oh, I'm sorry, you were first. You were discussing the paternalistic model where you think the government is a good vehicle to, uh, to create and distribute these. Okay. Well, with our economy based and the way it is, that a government is protective of its economy as well as its military uh, preeminence in the world, where, how do you figure our government is going to be benevolent enough to put something out that will help everybody and put it on an equal footing? Okay, the question is, uh, we proposed that the virus be released by the government. Um, I don't know that that's the best answer, but I think that's probably the only answer. And that's the paternalistic model. Really? Pardon? Do we trust the government to do the right thing? Will we trust the government? Okay, there's, so there's two questions. One is, why would we think the government would help us? Because they're spending money building up their military and things like that. Uh, to be honest, I don't know that the government in its present state would would be able to do that. And again, I think it would have to be a world body. I, I think we're talking about the future when uh, we'll have a more world-encompassing government. And that's one of the things I really believe in, is that in the future we'll have a more world-embracing government. We won't have these petty, uh, power-hungry individual governments that don't really care as much. And your question again was? Okay, the question. Okay, the question is, how can we trust the government to do the right thing, and to do it quickly enough? That's a that the reason that's a good question is because if any of you work for the government or have dealt with the government, it's a huge bureaucracy, and basically we're talking about years and decades before things. I'll get your question next, before things uh, get done, and. I don't have a good answer to that, but I can say that with groups like the World Health Organization, where they, 
those groups are actually much better. If they had the money and resources, for, for the resources they have, they do a really good job. For example, eradicating smallpox. Now, that's a government organization, but that's a really good example of one. So it, it may be possible, but like you said, it's, it's hard to trust the government. And, and, I, and I think open source will help a lot. If, I mean, that's one thing we can lobby for is for open source. You and then a question over here. Uh, okay, the question is, can I explain why replication or the actual, the viral life cycle, the, the thing that Bruce Schneier said is always bad, uh, how can that possibly be good uh, as opposed to just a controlled environment where, uh, for example, administrators update their scanning software? Okay, it kind of happens automatically. And, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can justify that except through the analogy again. I don't have a working model. Uh, that's what we're going to be working on in the next year. Hopefully we'll have something by next year. And if anyone here is a really good coder, please talk to me because we're going to need a lot of help building this. Uh, I think we had a question. <laughs> yes. You were saying that viruses have a negative connotation. I would draw more parallels to gene therapy and viruses are used as a vector to put in beneficial genes in the mission to destroy the engineer viruses to add to help. Excellent. I hadn't even thought of that. And the, the statement was that you can look at it from a genetic engineering perspective. And in genetic engineering, you often use viruses as vectors. Uh, I can tell you're a molecular biologist. Is that physicist? Physicist. OK, close enough. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that's, that's a good way to put it. I'm just teasing you. Uh, uh, but you're probably in a better industry than the molecular biologists right now, because those guys are having trouble getting jobs. We'll do one back here, and then we'll come up to you. I'm not worthy. We have Sarah Gordon here in the audience. Okay, well, uh, the, the correction was from the legendary Sarah Gordon, who I'm actually quite humbled is actually here uh, in this talk. And the correction she made was that the AV community doesn't uh, necessarily hate virus writers. And for me to make that statement was a stereotype, and I apologize. Uh, so is that acceptable? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, one here and then... Sorry, I'm missing you. Let's, let's do yours and then. Um, a few uh, recent months, uh, a computer virus was written that actually went out and updated all of my servers on the internet to protect them from their vulnerabilities. And, and the only flaw with that virus was that it had a back door in it that the labor enabled the virus writer to get into the system. What, do you have any comments on that virus? Do you think that's close to what you're thinking about, or is that a totally different? Um, and do you know who wrote that? OK, most of you probably do. Uh, the question was that, uh, and the question was that there was recently a virus that went through and fixed the bind vulnerability. Basically, it was a worm uh, that did kind of exactly what we're talking about here. The only flaw with that is that it left a back door in all the systems it infected, and it was released in the Department of Defense. And I believe the person who wrote that has just started their jail term. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, I believe that was written by Max Vision, who is quite famous in this circle. Uh, the irony of that is, in the future, the government will probably be coming to him for help on how to write this vaccine, because uh, he actually did it. He wrote a worm that went through and immediately patched this vulnerability, which was a huge vulnerability for the Department of Defense. The only problem is he did it without permission. And what, what the heck, by the way, he put in a back door uh, on every system of the Department of Defense. So he had the right idea, but I hope you all go about it in a way that doesn't get you arrested. We had a question here and then back. You said that this, uh, this immunization is going to be open source. Well, what's going to stop some people from just leaving and putting in uh, some nasty 
Okay, the, uh, the question is, if this is going to be open source, what's going to stop someone from taking what we've got and putting in a uh, nasty payload? And again, um, excellent question. I, I may be wrong here, but, but I, from, what, from the virus writers that I know, they, to me, a lot of them are real geniuses. And they can often go beyond what society even, or even the best programmers that I know can write. So they, I think they can personally do even better. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what's to keep uh, script kiddies from downloading this code, compiling it, and then releasing it uh, before it's available? And I don't have an answer to that yet, but hopefully by next year I will. <laughs> Question here, and then we're we're about to wrap up. So let's take a question here. Okay, and the, the, I'll get his question and then yours. The question is, uh, we have a, uh, what's the logic of having a virus that just confers immunity to one organism when antivirus uh, can do it automatically and much more efficiently? Is that your question? And you may be right. Uh, there's no guarantee that this would ever work. It's all hypothetical. But may, perhaps a combination of two, and the thing I, the thing I'm trying to present that I think will be the most important is the actual power of replication. And from what we've seen in medicine, it, it can be very powerful and useful. But it may be that we have to really harness it into an antivirus system such as one that IBM or other companies have developed. So you may be totally right. I may be totally wrong. We'll see. I'm sorry, can you speak up just a little bit? <laughs> I've access to quite a lot of statistics about how many viruses are affecting not just the, the, the names we're given out of the world, but the people who are over by others in various different corporations. And after something like I Love You comes out, there is a bit in the general overall level of virus activity. It takes time. However, I don't think most people. Okay. Ninety percent are already. Pardon? They won't want that. Okay, that's a very good point, and what he mentioned that, first of all, after there's a big infection like I love you, he, you said statistically there's a dip in the uh, number of viruses for the next few weeks or months after that. And so that may kind of be supportive of this whole theory, but at the same time he said people will, people don't want that I love you virus in the first place. They're never gonna accept the, the idea of a, a computer virus in the first place. They don't want the infection, even if it gives them that dip. Is that? Yeah, I would say that most corporates, they don't want to stop getting viruses by getting viruses. Most corporations don't want to stop getting viruses by getting viruses. And again, you may be perfectly correct. This is just a theory that is coming from medicine, which is my background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you uh, in medicine then? Okay, so this is a genetic engineer. We have a physicist. I'm actually a medical doctor myself. That's my background. So that's kind of how I'm coming from it, uh, bringing that. Now, there's a last question, I guess. Um, would you say to the degree that virus storage is really pretty much what you're talking about? In the last 10 years, you had the technology and technology and the practices increase to such a degree that it renders better than 90% of the viruses 
So the comment was, wouldn't you say that virus is already doing what I have proposed up here? In the last decade, uh, viruses have caused a resultant upsurge in antivirus technology, which has effectively gotten rid of most viruses and given us a great degree of protection. Is that? Okay. Because it was unnecessarily tight traffic. And in a sense, that one virus caused most major corporations to target themselves against a whole very variation of viruses. Okay. And so he pointed out the first VBS script virus already did this. It caused corporations to block VBS or to uh, update their systems in a way to protect from it. So you're perfectly correct. This is already happening. And I think it, if it weren't for the viruses that have already been written and the resultant antivirus community, society would be geared up for a big collapse. Just like the Native Americans in smallpox, they were wiped out overnight. So I think the viruses we've had that have infected us have actually been really good for us. They've given us an innate built-in immunity. And the last question is right here. Okay, then the probably the best point of the day is that uh, uh, the gentleman suggested that the uh, proposal here is kind of like bringing a bomb to an airport and blowing it up and saying, well, that's going to improve airport security. Why don't we go you know, blow up some airports? That's going to increase their defenses. Point taken. Uh, and again, this is, this, like you say, this is probably an extremely radical idea. And I think AV will uh, be violently opposed to it, may never accept it. And what I've tried to do is kind of bring what I've learned from medicine to, to this technology. And you remember back in the early smallpox vaccine days, people, you know, if, if they told you they were going to immunize you, you'd, you'd either kill them or run away. You didn't want that vaccine. I think that's probably where we're going to be at the beginning. So. Very good point, and you, you've really got to the heart of the matter. Well, thank you all for coming. I'll be around if any of you have any questions or comments.